And out of the ground made Yodhava Elohim to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we see these two trees talked about in the Genesis chapter 2, talking about them being in the garden. And you hear scholars and people who study the Bible trying to find these, this garden of Eden, its origin, uh, where Adam and Eve came from, and these two trees. And they assume it's in the Middle East by the different symbolisms that are in the Bible. But truly, they have forgotten themselves because these two trees in Eden is within us. They are representations of divinity, something that we have to build within. It is a representation of the being. And when I mean the being, I'm talking about our inner God, our innermost. So one of the best tools we have in order to know ourselves, in order to know the tree of life, and to be practical about it, is to use meditation. Meditation is the most powerful tool we have in order to transform ourselves, to know divinity. In Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, as we learned in the last uh, lecture, meditation is dhyana in the Ashtanga Yoga, the eight steps. Daya means to see. So we're seeing here, this is a type of perception. It's a level of consciousness. So if we want to see, we have to change of perception. And the tool that we can use to do that is meditation. So there's a quote by Samuel and Vior that says, it is completely impossible to experience the being, the innermost, the reality, or our inner God, with, without becoming true technical and scientific masters with the mysteries, mysterious science of medita called meditation. So as you see here, he's saying that we have to be masters of meditation if we want to experience the being or divinity or reality. Now, this type of mastery is not something we're going to get in a weekend, in a few months, or even a few years. It's a, it's a lifetime of work. But it is possible. The being is represented by what is called in the Bible the tree of life. That tree of life is a map of reality at our states of consciousness or our states of being. It shows all the different subtleties and densities of energy and matter. Each one of these spheres that you see is called a sephiroth. It's also a representation of the universe, but it can be representation of us within. It represents the spinal column as you see in the picture. We ourselves are located on this map at Makuth, which is the physicality, or the physical world. To think that we can reach God just through the physicality is taking a perspective of an atheist or materialist. Many people who study religion stop there, and then they look for it without, just in the physical. But really, if we examine ourselves, we'll see that we are much less in the physical than we are actually in the physicality. We're all within our thoughts and emotions at all times. If we're watching TV, that takes us out of our body and just is in our thoughts and emotions. We forget about our body in those moments, which is not good. We're not actually aware. But it proves a point that the thoughts cannot be grabbed. We cannot see them, can't smell them, hear them, or taste them. We can sense them. Same thing with feelings we have uh, in, in the heart. We can feel an emotion, but in a sense, it, in a, which affects the physical body. But it's really the emotion that comes first and then affects the physical body. It's something that we sense. Same thing with energy. If we have energy in the body. We can feel that we have a lot of energy. And we can direct that energy with willpower, which can affect our physica, physical world, but as well as the internal worlds, our spiritual development. Same thing happens with divinity. We can sense divinity. We can sense a type of intuition. 
So when we're very relaxed in meditation, that mind becomes reflective and we can, with the energy is calm, the emotion and, and the thoughts are calm. We can see or sense types of intuition, types of divinity. And that's the connection that we're looking for. Without that connection, we're going in, in much of humanity's direction. Where much of them don't care about their spiritual development or divinity, or they don't know how or what to do. And that's why the whole world is really going mad. We have to keep ourselves equilibrated and to work with divinity, to have that connection. And one of the ways we do that is through knowing the tree of life and to meditate is one of our greatest tools. So what we really need, what we're talking about is we need some sort of transformation. When we sit in meditation or we have a moment of intuition where it hits us and we go, I know that's true. That will change our actions into others that may seem odd. For instance, performing maybe an anger moment or something of lust. In your intuition, you know this is wrong. To others, they may seem it proper to get angry or use or be lustful. So others, it seems strange. But your intuition says, no, this is not right. Because you know something is true. Something like that transforms us. It's a knowledge that we receive from experience. This knowledge is what we call dot, which is the sphere, that golden sphere, as you see, on the tree of life. And near the top, in the middle, dot means knowledge. It is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Dot itself means knowledge. Gnosis, the tradition that we follow, means knowledge as well in Greek. That type of knowledge is not something that we get from books or watch videos or listen to something. That's just knowledge that we get through the mind. That's just imitated. This type of knowledge is the something we get from experience. And the normal example we always use, if you stick your hand in a fire, it burns. Therefore, we don't need anyone to tell us that burning your hand is a good thing. We just learn that through that type of experience. But that's a very superficial way of describing this type of knowledge. What really we're talking about is knowledge that's with the consciousness. That is something that can transform us truly because we know that it's true. We experience it within our, ourselves. This is what we call the tree of knowledge. These two trees have also been explained in the Egyptian mythologies, as you see with the two trees. And if you look at Buddhism and Hinduism, you'll see a very similar thing. So these trees have always been discussed in different religions. The tree of life comes from Judaism and really Christianity because it's mentioned in the Bible. But this type of knowledge that we're studying now is, you could say, Kabbalah. Kabbalah comes from the root word Kabbalah, which means to receive. And what are we trying to do with this? We're trying to calm the mind, calm the body, in order to see a greater perception, which is meditation, which receives. So something, this is alive within us something that we learned through the consciousness is what we call in the West was always known as alchemy. Alchemy is consumed of two words. Al reminds of the Arabic God, Allah. Or in Hebrew, El, which means God. They have Kem, means to forge or to cast metal. So alchemy is someone that is fusing themselves or casting themselves with God. Eastern tradition, this is known as Tantra, or the, a continuum or unbroken stream, a continuum of vital energy that supports the organism and is never unbroken. Or you could say the, where we harness vital energy in order to transform ourselves or the practitioner. And in esoteric psychology, this is known as a transformation of impressions. And we use all three of these terms in Gnosis. So sometimes you'll see them interchanged. The transformation of impressions is 
probably makes the most sense to the English language. We've probably all heard these terms. In Makuth, this transformation of impressions, what we're doing is we're, you say, becoming. We're transforming that energy and we're transforming it for better or for worse. The bhava chakra means, bhava means becoming, chakra means wheel, the wheel of becoming, also known as the wheel of samsara, which is that wheel that we're always trapped in because of the energy that we have been transforming is very mechanical. So it's represented by a wheel. And it's controlled by vices that we have within, which is interesting. The monster that's grabbing that wheel is called Yama, which means lies, that the wheel is trapped by illusions. In Gnosis, we use the example on the right, which is more uh, easier to understand, which is the wheel of evolution and de-evolution. Depending on how we transform that energy, we evolve or de-evolve. But as well as a third aspect, which is called revolution, in which we look to get off that wheel, to evolve spiritually. Samuel Ombiora says, we are here in the physical world in this fallen Sephiroth. In Malkuth, Malkuth is the physicality. Here is where we are studying, preparing, working. But Malkuth is not just the physical world. Remember that in the interior of the earth, in the infra dimensions, are Klipoth, and these are from Malkuth. So Malkuth, as we could say, again, is that bottom sphere on the tree of life. Below that sphere is what we call Klipoth. Klipoth means hell, uh, hell realms or empty shells, basically a consciousness that can no longer hold any light. So it's been cut off. So it's better for that consciousness, for that soul to be recycled within hell so it has another chance at divinity. Because at that moment, it's an empty. It's actually full of ego, you could say, or crap within, but nothing that can harness light. Makuth is also known as the world, world of action because this is where the actions we participate in in order to take that energy and direct it to the way we want. What I said is Makuth is becoming because we're becoming what, how we direct our energy. But where does this becoming come from? Where does it originate? Originates originally from what we call at least from this tree of life, is at the absolute. Better understood, this is a very abstract idea, because the absolute is considered nothing. Nothing to the mind. It has no reference. So sometimes when this is talked about, especially when you hear it from the first time, it's very hard to, to grasp. The absolute is considered uncreated light. You could compare this to, you look at the night sky, we just see blackness. But it's obvious there must be something there because what's keeping the planets in a line, what's creating different solar systems, different planets, different galaxies. So there must be something there that we don't quite see. So we call that the uncreated light. It's light that we can't see. But out of that light comes a manifestation you could say the sun, a very pure light that comes out of the darkness. This is always known as Keter, or our father, the father. That light descends down out of love, that Christic force, into the sun, Chokmah. And it continues into Bana, the Holy Spirit. Obviously, this is known as the Holy Trinity also known on the tree of life as the world of absolute, the archetypes. It's called the archetypes because that energy has the architecture to build the rest of the tree of life, but is not in manifestation yet. And this is defined right in the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That first statement, the first line in the Genesis. 
if you break this down in Hebrew, in the beginning, what is the beginning? The beginning is the absolute. So it says the beginning created. Then God created. So it's a little, the English translation is not exact. So in the beginning created, Elohim, which is God in Hebrew. But again, if we look at the Hebrew translation, Elohim is broken down into words. El, which means God. Elohim means goddesses. So goddesses, gods and goddesses. Also, if you expand that a little bit, God and goddesses of the sea. So Elohim, that manifestation from the beginning, that uncreated light, has everything it needs to create the tree of life. It's showing that God is a duality of male and female. You can see sometimes this tree of this uh, trinity can be also be called the father. And many of these things, uh, these names can be interchanged. If you break this down, and if in, you read the Hebrew, um, it's more exact, but we're not going to get into that into this lecture. Just note that the Father can be also known as the Trinity, because really the Trinity is three and one, one and three, or monotheistic, polytheistic, meaning there is multiplicity in the unity, or unity in the multiplicity. It says, our authentic being in his essential roots is the ancient of the days. He is the father in us. He is our true being. So the ancient of the days in the Bible is Keter, the father. Second logos, Hokmah, is love. This is considered the Christ, son. Agnes die, the immor immortalated lamb. It is the fire that burns since the beginning of the world in all creation. For our salvation, Hokmah, is fire and underlines the depth of all organic and inorganic matter. The Holy Spirit unfolds itself into the ineffable woman. She is the divine mother. She is dressed in white tunic in a blue mantle. The Holy Spirit is Shiva, divine spouse of Shakti, divine mother Kundalini. In the Bible, this is always known as the Holy Mary. So this energy descends down into our physicality and the vitality that we have, the energy we have within. It's what sustains life. It's what creates life. The energy created the archetypes above. And as well, it creates us physically, gives us energy, sustains us. Then energy descends into the body and stimulates what we call the three brains. It's the tools that we use in order to transform energy. We have the intellect which is the brain, so the intellectual brain. We have the emotional brain, which relates to the heart and the nervous system. And as well, we have the motor, instinctual, sexual center, which relates with the spinal column. Each one of these relates with the spheres on the left. So for instance, the intellectual brain is not thoughts it, itself. It doesn't create the thought but it receives it from, we call it Netzach, the mental body or the mental world. The emotional body, the emotion is not the emotion. It doesn't create the emotion, but it receives it from what we call Hod or the astral body. The same goes with motor instinctual sexual center, receives that energy, which we call the vital body, which is in Yesod. So to give an example, of how this works. For instance, when I was young, I was always afraid of dogs because my next door neighbor had hunting Dalmatian dogs and I was nearly as tall as they were. And they were quite aggressive and freaked me out. So I was quite fearful from dogs when I was little, or even, even when I got older. Even when I saw a dog and it was friendly, I wanted nothing to do with it. What was happening there was I was, had an impression when I was young saw it through my eyes, into the brain and the emotion, it was imprinted, that image, into the mental body and the astral body, or you could say the emotional body. So it was imprinted in my ment mentality and emotion. So when I saw 
a dog, even if the thing was very friendly, I saw a dog when in my mind, it sent that image and matched it up within the mental body and the astral body, and it brought back emotions and thoughts. And therefore, then it receives in my brain and the heart, and I reacted mechanically to it. The initial reaction was fear to get out of there. And this made no sense if you saw a dog that was very friendly. But for me, this did because of the experience. Later on, I noticed that dogs were, a lot of dogs were friendly. And you could tell the difference. So when that, when I initially saw dogs, there wasn't always an initial fear. But once I noticed that, it's like, no, there's no reason to be fearful. So I was transforming that energy and then it gets reflected back into the mental body as well as the astral or the emotional body. Therefore, transforming that impression. So our bodies are really reflectors of energy and transformers of them. This just makes sense when we say mechanicity. We talk about makuth as the world of action. Is that energy comes here and we act mechanically and we react. And this is all of humanity does. They think they are performing actions, but really they're reacting with what's inside. And the only way to change that is to transform that energy. These three brains have always been known as the bodies of sin because of the way we transform energy. Mostly for ego or for a self-interest. Someone who conquers these three aspects, the asod, which relates to the vital energy with the body, hod, which relates to our emotion, and the exact, you know, it's the mental, is someone that becomes very beautiful, which we know in an exact is called victory. And hold it glory. Someone who conquers them has glory and victory. Because not only are they comprehending with the mind, but they're having comprehension of the heart. Jesus Christ shows on the left. Unfortunately for us, we have participated in the tree of life. And we've continuously ate from the tree of knowledge. We've made the mistake of Adam and Eve, in which we're continuously eating from that tree. That energy comes into us from above and enters into these bodies of sin. And we transform the energy incorrectly. And what we create is something that is opposed to that higher force, to the being, to divinity, in which we create something called me and I, or an ego. When that is created, that is an aspect that negatively transforms that energy. And so again, that's why these bodies are considered the bodies of sin. These are always known as the three traitors of Jesus. In Hebrew, this is known as the world of Yetzirah, which is the world of formation, because we're forming the soul. And again, if someone forms this and has glory and victory and has built the foundation, it becomes very beautiful. That beauty is what is known in Tiferet. Because someone is within their energy, within their emotion, in which their mental is all aligned with divinity and in their will, their willpower. And therefore they become very beautiful. This is why a lot of saints, a lot of very um, people that are looked up to in different religions are seen with great beauty. Because they're will aligns with God, aligns with divinity, their being. But this cannot be done without the help of divinity. So above Tifereth, you see two others, Geberah and Hesed, which mean justice and mercy. These are two things that are of love. If we see a parent, and at least if they're a good parent, they don't punish the child because they just want to hurt the child. No, they do it because of love, because they understand that the child acts in that way. 
they won't be able to go out on their own. They could end up living on the street, partaking, partaking in activities that don't benefit them. Therefore, they're punished or they're taught a lesson that feels like punishment because it's opposed to what the child thinks they want. This is what justice and mercy mean. It relates to karma. We receive karma and we think it's some sort of punishment because it's painful, and it is. But these, otherwise, if we did not have these aspects, we couldn't learn. If you take this from a very superficial point of view, it, it will feel like punishment. But if we really try to dive into the depths of that by using the tool of meditation, we can better understand what is happening in our lives. Has said is always known as our father. He's known as the warrior in this picture here of King Arthur. He's known as the warrior because he is the one who's fighting for that soul below, for the soul to form, trying to teach the human to transform that energy correctly, always fighting. He's trying to reach to us, but we're just ignoring. What's interesting, if you look here, you see King Arthur, you see three swans. That's showing the Trinity. As well as interesting enough, he, you see a sword coming out of the water held by hand, which we'll talk about later, but this is referencing the spinal column. On the left, you see, which is the painting called Damsel, not in distress. Damsel is just a beautiful woman that's... Uh, not married. So here you see a, an individual dressed in very beautiful armor, reflective armor, killing an enemy to save the woman. That, per that person in the armor killing the enemy is known as the human soul, Tifereth. It's showing great beauty because it's that armor is showing great beauty and reflectiveness. Showing it's a that person has perfected the bodies below and has now reached Tifereth and has had victory and has conquered the ego, those psychological aggregates that we have in, in order to rescue his consciousness, or in this instance, the divine soul, Gebera. Gebera is shown very beautifully because it's of divinity. Now, in these aspects here, I wouldn't get this, as you get higher up in this tree, all this becomes less intellectual and becomes more intuitive. And even speaking about this myself, it's hard for to put this stuff in words because this is very high level. So if you've ever studied the tree of life, sometimes when you get up to this level, it can be tough to, all right, how does this work? Um, in meditation, it may make sense, but to put it into words, it's, it's always hard to explain. This is described in the Bible, this triangle that we see, which is known as the world of Bria, which is the world of creation. Because above this, we see the archetypes. The Father puts them into activity and creates below. Puts that light into activity. It says in the Bible, and God said, let there be light, and, there and the light was. And that light is descending down, creating. And then that creation below has formation. There's form of the soul. In order for that soul to completely form, it needs action. And those four worlds that we talked about. Now, the most important part of the tree is in any building, if you don't have a sound foundation, if you don't put the building blocks and make them level, make them solid in the ground, the building's going to sink. It'll be awkward. It'll fall down. So we always need a good foundation. That is, without a doubt, the most important. That foundation is always known as Yesod. The translation of Yesod is foundation. You can see that it is at the bottom of the, nearly at the bottom of the tree. Makutas is at the very bottom. But Yesod is there. Yesod is the vital energy 
of the physical body. When your soul runs out of energy, the physical body dies. At night, when we go to sleep, we leave our physical body, and that vital body has a chance to recharge from that energy above, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It recharges. Therefore, when we wake up in the morning, we have more energy. Or we take a nap, we feel better. Yisod is that reflective force within. You can may feel that when sometimes if you go to sleep, you feel you're floating. That's that vital body. So to build the foundation, we need the foundation of life. What is the foundation of life? It's creation. Above, the, the uncreated light created. The foundation that we have here is creation. We would not be alive unless our parents had sex. That's what you saw it represents, the sexual force. But also represents everything else above. Because it is what supports the whole rest of the soul. If we do not have energy, if we were never born, we could forget about having thoughts or emotion or any type of will. It wouldn't be existence. So sex is essential for that to happen. You can see here in that Zak and Hod represent the mental and the emotional aspects. They are above Yesod. So without that foundation there, those two couldn't exist. So it has, or the vital body, or you could say sometimes it's ether, has four modalities. We have the chemical ether, which is the process of assimilation and elimination, which really means like the physical body, it eats and eliminates through going to the bathroom. Ether of life, related to the process of reproduction, which I just talked about. But the two we really should focus on are two below. Because if we have these down, then especially the last one, the rest will reflect. We have the luminous ether. This is the vital energy that's going into different qualities that we have. Some people you've noticed have a bigger body or they have a great intellect, um, intellectual capacity. It's because that vital energy is being fed into those type of qualities. It's just that they're receiving more energy into the intellect or more into the body. Therefore, it reflects in their physicality. You see these animals, like an eagle or different animals have a great sense of smell. It's just that vital aspect is focusing on those senses. The reflective ether, as here, says imagination and will in all creatures. It's that the physical body is mostly water. In the ether, it's kind of, you say, vaporous, very similar. The reflective aspect is like water. If we're very calm and the body and the mind are calm as well as the energy within, then it's easy for us to see what's going on in our thoughts. It's easy to be very objective in our thoughts and emotions. We can get better senses of divinity or intuition in how to act. The one way we do this is through meditation. So the prerequisite of that is relaxation. If we're not relaxed, we're wasting energy. So that is a prerequisite. When we're relaxed, it reflects images. Because you see, that reflective quality is reflecting the whole tree of life. Because you so it is, is supporting, is the foundation. So it's reflecting the whole rest of the tree of life. If those waters are as calm as this lake, it reflects the sky perfectly. If we're fidgety, we're moving around, we have waves in the water. Therefore, the body becomes unsettled, we become fidgety, thoughts are surging, emotions are surging. And we don't really get any true, really any good knowledge. We just know that our minds are crazy. Same thing with the lake. If it has waves, it's not going to reflect the sky. It's going to be very distorted. This is why a lot of people walk away from meditation because they sit down and automatically is sowed, the vital body is reflecting what's in them. And it, they're like, I can't do this. My friend can do it. I can't do it. 
That's not true. You have to learn to relax first. So I always tell people, before meditation, learn to relax. Sit in a room. Turn the lights off. Just sit there for 10 minutes. Get rid of the phone. The phone is probably one of the worst things for relaxation and for the mind. It's, it's a complete detriment. Go outside. Sit down. Look at nature. Just get relaxed. Get used to, of that habit of how to relax. I, teaching meditation, one of the things that astounded me was how little people know how to sit down and just relax. I, I found that astounding when I first did it. But that is the very, very first step we need. And is a prerequisite before we even think about meditation, before we think about concentration or trying to imagine. We really need to get that down. And with time, it will. And it won't take long. It really won't. If you do it every day for 10 minutes, just trying to relax, it'll expand. Before you know it, you're sitting longer. Before you know it, you're actually having concentration when you're not even trying. But if you want to push further, we have to work on our concentration. You have to work on imagination, which we talked about. We just talked about on the site. You can look at Meditation Essentials on the website, and it'll talk much about this. So that reflective, we'll see the reflectance in the mind and the emotion. And that mirror, when it's calm, will be able to even get signals from divinity. So how do we work with the vital energy? The basic aspects that we work with is pranayama, sexual transmutation, runes, mantras, and the rites of rejuven rejuvenation, which is related with similar to Tai Chi or yoga, in a sense. When I mentioned pranayama and sexual transmutation, this is a representation of the waters, again, the waters of the sexual force. That force, again, like I said, is the creative force of what creates a human body. Everyone knows this. You don't have to be intelligent for that to happen. It's a mechanical force, but it also has intelligence to it. If we really use it intelligently, is to transmute that force. Single person is a pranayama through breathing exercises, where we raise that sexual force. As you see here, the tree of life is aligned up with the spinal column. You have the brain at the top. You see the nervous system there, the central nervous system, coming down the middle column of the tree of life. And it ends at Yasod. It really is Sod and Makuth, which is the vital body and the physical body, are really kind of the same. You can say them as one. So the energy descends down into us. And yes, we have to transform the energy in the mind and as well as the motion. We're trying to refine those types of energies and even our will. But if you want to take it a step further, if you want to advance spiritually, if you want to calm that mind down further, we have to work with the sexual force as well. This is why in all religions, they always talked about chastity or brahmacharya. That is a superficial thing, but as well, physically as well, and energetically as well. So if we have a spouse, we practice what we call sexual magic or sexual alchemy. where We perform the act of sex without the orgasm, without releasing those fluids. That heat will raise that energy up, will be reflected, which we call the, in one of the ethers, the ether of life, and is raised up to the brain. As you see here, the foundation is always a stone, the philosophical stone in the Masons. Everyone was always looking for the fountain of life, which is Gesod. King Arthur, you see King Arthur taking the sword out of the stone. Well, obviously, that's referring to the spinal column and your sword. You can see here that spinal column looks like a sword. Meaning that person, that individual is transmuting their energy, not only sexually, but mentally and emotionally. Jacob planted a stone at Bethel, it says here, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, surely, Yod 
is in this place, and I knew it not. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. Well, the oil, obviously, is that energy that's flowing down the tree of life into your soul, onto the pillar. Bethel means the house of God. Beth, house, God. And really, if you look at the Bible, it says Luz instead of Bethel. That's translated as almond tree. So this is, should, I don't think I need to explain that at this lecture. And we have two other quotes here. Jesus Christ said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man and build his house upon a rock which obviously is the foundation, your sowed, sex. The other quote says, He that is wounded in the stones, or hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter unto the congregation of the Lord. Now again, obviously this is talking the stones, private member, members, which is the sexual organs, have been cut off. Uh, that's either physically or internally, we're not transmuting. If our body is damaged in this way, we shouldn't lose hope that if we're meditating, we can transform energy. We can transfer what's in the mind and what's in the heart. We should always keep in mind of the laws of karma. As Samuel Onvior always says, when an inferior law is transcended by a superior law, then the superior law washes away the inferior law. Now, this is the general concept of karma. So if we're performing good actions, that is going to wash away an inferior law. So possibly in this life, we may not have a body that could work the way we want. But if we keep performing good actions, a superior law will come in, and hopefully we'll have a body that's more workable in the future. So the tree of knowledge and good of evil is referencing that energy that is flowing from above and that how we're transforming into truth in order to know the being, in order to know the tree of life, divinity. When we make the, the mistake of eating the apple from the tree of knowledge, that's eating the energy, the divine energy for our own purposes in which we create something of ego. The purpose of life is to know the tree of life, to know divinity, to be it, to know it, dot, the true knowledge of it.